few more minutes. Okay, let me. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> I want this recorded. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Anita Adams. I am the founder and executive director of First Weekend Club. Thank you so much for coming out on this absolutely gorgeous day. Wow, like you guys are committed. That's fantastic. I really appreciate you being here. I'm really excited uh, to share the news with you guys about Canada Screens, our VOD platform now being available, um, or not available, um, triggering. You're going to be difficult, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that was on. <laughs> so Canada Screens has just been recognized as an acceptable online service that triggers tax credits, which is, yeah, right? <laughs> really excited about that. Um, and it was actually Leah here who said, called me up one day, and she's like, you know, they've made some changes. You should look into this. And so I poked around, looked into it, did all the work you need to do to get... All her, all her. And then I'm like, okay, what does that mean exactly? Because <laughs> I really didn't know. And um, I've learned a lot, and today I'm expecting to learn a lot more. And part of the reason why I wanted to put this panel together was so I could actually really grasp how things have changed in the industry. So I'll be sitting here writing notes um, as well. Um, I chose not to sit on the panel. Um, but I'm here to address, if anybody has questions about our platform, about Canada Screens, I'm here to answer them, of course. So I'm happy to jump up and just shout out or whatever. And I'll be hanging out around afterwards as well. Um, just really quickly, Canada Screens is very much like an iTunes model. It's a pay-per-view model. And um, we, we model our, um, our revenue uh, sharing with the filmmaker or the rights holders, um, very much like iTunes does. Um, but you can ask me more questions about how our system is set up um, afterwards. And I just want to thank our panel. Thank you, all of you, for making time to come and be a part of this today and sharing your knowledge and expertise. Really appreciate that. And Leah, for all the extra work you're putting in to help with this. I'd like to acknowledge our, um, our partners who made this possible, uh, the Canadian Media Producers Association, BC Branch. Thank you, thank you. Um, and the Van City Theater, um, the Van City Theater, are, um, they made this very, very affordable for our little nonprofit. So thank you, Van City Theater. And Telefilm Canada, uh, ACTRA, uh, UBC ACTRA, and, um, and Creative BC are some of our local strong partners that have been supporting our organization for a long time. So thank you. And we've got a Creative BC rep on here. Yes, thank Woo! you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Leah, to do the proper introduction. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. And thanks, yes, everyone for being here on this beautiful day. Um, so I'm Leah Mellon. I'm an independent producer here in Vancouver, and my company is called All In Pictures. I've developed and produced everything from feature films to documentaries to series, uh, animated content, interactive di digital content. So I've probably applied for every piece of funding you could possibly apply for in this country. <laughs> but I'm really pleased to have this amazing panel because this really is an amazing array of talent, experience, and insight into representing so many aspects of, of content funding and creation. So, so I'm going to briefly introduce everyone. And I, they all have a long, long uh, experience list of credits and, and accolades, but I shortened it. So please don't any of you be offended if it's too short. But I'll start down there. That's Tim Mudd. So Tim's a business analyst in the tax credit department at Creative BC. And he has a decade of film and television experience. He produced digital media strategies, including working alongside Chris Haddock on CBC series Da Vinci's Inquest and Intelligence, among others. Uh, and sitting next to him is Lauren Berkovich. So Lauren is a producer. Her company is Kelly and Kelly Creative. She has come to Vancouver via Toronto, San Francisco, and Nova Scotia in 2007. And she did a uh, early on. She did five year stint at Adbusters Magazine as their production manager, and she helped launch the Occupy Wall Street movement. So Lauren uh, moved to, on to film and television. She produced everything from reality cooking shows to Hallmark movies, from indie docs to web series. And she's now started 
this new creative studio, Kelly and Kelly, where she's the CFO, director of operations, and boss lady of all podcast and video production. So at the studio, among uh, many other things, they've produced the video version of This Is That, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and that has garnered millions of views online across multiple platforms. So we're really excited to talk about Lauren's experience. Um, and next to Lauren is Jonas Wust, who's been the executive producer, original content at Story at, at Story Hive at Telus since 2015, which provides millions of dollars of funding as well as exposure to Canadian filmmakers. Previously, Jonas was with the CBC, where he ran CBC Music, and he was also the head of music at the London-based digital music startup Last FM, which sold to CBS for just a mere $280 million. <laughs> so welcome, Jonas. Um, and next, Jonas is Jeff Young, associate counsel at the law firm Altman & Company. He has extensive uh, entertainment law experience. He's also a professor at the University of Victoria, where he teaches entertainment law. He's also worked as a music composer, producer, and supervisor as well. So he has a really uh, varied background in many aspects of the media sector. And then next to me is Catherine Warren, a communications chair of the Bell Fund Board. She also serves as president and board director at Canada's Centre for Digital Media and is on the board of DigiBC. She uh, is a member of the International Academy of Television Arts and Sciences and is executive board director of the United Nations flagship program World Summit Awards for Digital Media. Her company, Fan Trust, provides growth strategies for the entertainment and media tech sectors and has created the fan strategies for mega hits such as Homeland and the CSI television franchise and also one of my little projects way back when. <laughs> so welcome everyone, thank you so much. Um, so I think that obviously we content creators are feeling that this is, um, times have changed. There's, a, there's cord cutters, illegal streamers, less license fees, more media amalgamation happening in our broadcast sector, which means less and less traditional places for content creators to go to pitch their f and finance their content. Yet with this change landscape comes opportunity. So viral videos that launch the careers of many talents, interactivity and immersive content, web series that can be inexpensive to produce and therefore possibly provide emerging production companies and storytellers to find ways to find audiences, new platforms and financing partners. So there are new ways to market our content, crowdsourcing our audiences and creative control can remain in the hands of the original storytellers. So funds that have traditionally relied on a broadcast trigger are now willing to come in if you've shown that you have an audience. And now some of these new models are triggering our tax credit system as well. So we will learn all the ins and outs of that here. Um, so let's first start talking a little bit about changes. And maybe I'll start with you, Catherine. So the Bell Fund um, just recently went through a big overhaul, a big change. So maybe Catherine can now tell us a little bit about how things have, have changed a lot at that fund. So this has been a big year for Canada's Bell Fund, but also for you, our national production community. The fund is celebrating 20 years of support for digital and television entertainment. And we've recently sunset all of our programs and rolled out four new funding programs. Um, these replace our original interactive media funds that some of you may be familiar with. And why did we make these changes? Well, we made them in response to our regulator, the CRTC. And the shift is largely to support um, the production of video for distribution on all platforms, including streaming, the legal kind. <laughs> uh, today, only our television funding program requires you to have a broadcast license. So there's a lower barrier to entry for a number of you that want to work, say, um, outside the traditional broadcast system. And um, uh, with our other grants, they can be triggered by Canadian distribution of many kinds, including, for example, YouTube and Facebook. So um, ideally, this sounds like a good news story to you, but we're also learning along the way. Um, and we're very open to feedback because we're piloting these programs. Um, and 
as some of you may know, the programs take a lot to apply to. So I just want to kind of talk to you about at a high level what's involved in applying. Um, and, and so you can decide if you really want to make that commitment to what is, in fact, a very competitive process. Um, so at a high level, the four new programs that we offer for production and development are short form digital series, immersive web docs, slate development, and TV program production. So a few of these I'll highlight today, and then I'm also available for questions. Um, and we've posted a rolling frequently asked questions on the Bell Fund website that we're updating on a very regular basis. I think there are 90 Q&As last time I looked. Um, and um, you know, I, I really want us to appear to be and to in fact be very responsive. And your questions mean a lot to us, so ask us along the way. Um, our short form digital series grant offers both production and marketing financing um, for digital series including fiction and nonfiction. And um, the award is up to $100,000 for the production and $50,000 for what we call discoverability. And um, what you do need is distribution, including a great distribution plan and a license agreement. So, um, what's involved there is you have to demonstrate the relevance of your content to the platform, um, and the platforms have to be available to all Canadians. So, um, uh, for example, a um, platform that's associated with a broadcaster where you have to have a cable subscription is not available to all Canadians, but a platform like Crave is available to all Canadians, albeit paying Canadians. Um, uh, the other thing that I, I really want you, encourage you uh, to encourage you to think about is you can also self-publish. So if you have a successful um, niche channel or destination online that's relevant to the type of content you want to develop, so for example, a highly successful comedy destination on YouTube, you can be your own distributor. Um, you need 10% third-party financing, uh, and that includes tax credits. However, the discoverability piece is fully funded. You don't need any third-party funding. Um, you also need to apply with a trailer. So our evaluators are looking very closely at the production and entertainment value of what it is you propose to produce. And a series is defined as a run of six. Um, but those can be episodes of any length. So, so there's some flexibility there. And I realize this is a, a large panel. I do have uh, information on the other funds, but perhaps that's a good beginning. What do you think? Yeah, okay. Start. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. I'll have, we can ask some more questions as we go along, too. Um, so, Jonas, I did want to talk to you a little bit just about if you could. Uh, speak to Story Hive. You, it's been a really um, amazing, actually, opportunity for for filmmakers in both Alberta and BC. I've been mentoring a lot of the films, and that's actually how I met Lauren. Um, be, and there's, you know, they've supported an incredible array of content and filmmakers, and so many of those filmmakers. It's launched careers, and so. It's a really huge opportunity here here in BC and Alberta. Um, so Jonas, obviously there's a there's a unique format though in how um, audi uh, you know the content creators are, are asked to almost sort of uh, present themselves in a unique way for competing for the funding. And I was curious because looking at that, you know, I, I thought to myself, that's probably a decision being made to avoid the sort of long and winding road of development and having to have commissioning editors and people that, um, like the traditional broadcasters, um, would approach content. Is that, was that the intent and how is it working and maybe you can speak to it. How did, what did you say? It was a unique, <laughs> it was a way, unique, unique way. decision making? Are you referring well, yeah, to the a voting A unique way of? for, for uh, content creators to, to apply for funding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's maybe for those of you, if you, if you don't know what story I have is, so we um, uh, provide production support, production grants, uh, training and distribution to filmmakers in BC and Alberta. Anyone who is uh, lives in BC and Alberta, any um, uh, citizen, Canadian citizen, or permanent resident is eligible to apply. Um, um, and I think uh, what you're referring to, 
if you want to get right to this, the, the voting aspect. So one thing that we, we ask for um, most of the additions that we run, actually not all additions, additions is what we call um, funding rounds or funding deadlines. We call them additions, it's kind of, I feel like it sounds fancy or something. <laughs> so f in, uh, for most additions you are um, encouraged to uh, build a community around your project uh, before we potentially fund you. And we, we measure that um, community through, through voting. So um, you kind of put up a pitch and the pitch is public, including a, a, a pitch video. And um, the idea kind of came from Kickstarter, like back in the days when Kickstarter was kind of new and was kind of exciting. You know, you watch that video and then you put something in there. So we, we got inspired by that. You put up a pitch video and you ask the, uh, the community for votes. There's two things that are happening with the, um, when, when, when people get votes and they're really key to the program. So the one thing is that's really important is that the, the, the creators, they build their audience before they even make the content. And, and that is, we might get to that later as well, that's, that can be absolutely key, especially in times when broadcasters are not always able to support you the way that they were, they were maybe in the past. So for you to be able to build your community, your audience, your customers, um, that's an absolute key thing. And, and, and we, yeah, quite frankly, we force our creators to, to do that beforehand. And, um, and it comes to the decision-making criteria uh, when, we, when we fund the content. So that's the votes. The other thing that's happening, which is just as important, is that, so we're just, uh, on the story of team, we're just humans, right? We make decisions. And, and there's always a danger that, especially when you've been there for a few years, that you have certain, hopefully, unconscious biases, or you fund certain things, or certain people, or certain stories. I've or never something. seen a commissioning editor do that ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So, so what we um, what we force us to do is when when we have these projects and we have these pitches, and you know, there's often projects in there that have a lot of support, a lot of votes, that I maybe. Speaking for myself, not for my uh, for my colleagues, I wouldn't fund for whatever reason because maybe I just and and that's a good thing that really puts some of the power in the community and not not in my hands yeah. because that's not they don't give the power to me that's not a good idea. So we funded a number of things where I thought like really are we doing this okay that's, <laughs> oh, yeah well that's fine and the the outcomes that we see is just it's amazing and, and okay it, now you have to cite an example of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, um, maybe without giving examples, is especially the kind of individuals where, this is maybe just my bias, where I feel kind of like, oh, can they pull this off? You know, they have an ambitious idea, they don't quite maybe have the track record to, to show like they can do this, and my, I'm always like, maybe I'm sort of risk averse, like, oh, if we're giving $10,000, you know, mm -hmm. are they going to do it? And the stuff they can do, and them being the sort of the experienced filmmaker, it's just incredible, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and most importantly, what because we, we meet all the creators and what happens to those creators how they were like you know they they they, they don't know what they're doing they like really starting their career right they might have made a film in, in university and we give them ten thousand dollars and the way they grow through mm -hmm. the process that's amazing that's yes. incredible and i maybe wouldn't have allowed that individual to grow because i would have thought like oh maybe they're not going to pull this off mm -hmm. um so the uh, that's where the voting is amazing and just to finish this off um it is only a part of decision making however because it is uh it can't be the only thing. We, we cannot rely just on, on audience feedback to make funding decisions. It's, it's good in some ways. It's bad in other ways because um, what we see sometimes is certain individuals, certain communities just have more support. There are just more people of a certain color or people of a certain um, social economic stand, um, uh, position in BC and Alberta. And we need to make sure, and we do make sure, that those people that might not have a big community behind them, they might have the resources to get a big audience, or they don't, I just don't have the, uh, the expertise yet, um, that of course they're also allowed to come in. So there's the right. voting and the jury, it, it is, and we have this conversation all the time, what's the right balance, but there is right. a balance then, well, and we're trying to figure it out. Wow, that's amazing. Well, and I see too, with all of the different programs you guys have launched, you're also really trying to uh, work with different sectors of the community, with animation, with female directors. And then recently you guys launched the $100,000 one, which was a big leap. Can you just speak a bit about that and what, why the decision to go in such a big way? And I'm mentoring some of those and I'm, like you, I'm surprised at seeing what is coming out of maybe some teams that I maybe at the beginning I was a little worried about in terms of their expertise, but they're actually you know doing really well, so. so um I'm going to keep this brief so other people mm -hmm. can speak as well. Um, 
Storyhive. Okay, Storyhive, and I kind of mentioned this. We actually don't want to fund films. We don't really care about the films that much. We, we don't see ourselves as a film funder. Mm. We want to create filmmakers. And this is this kind of you know, giving that individual who really has no experience mm -hmm. and give them some money and they build experience, right? They really yeah. grow their career. And we, we see that all the, all the time on the $10,000 level. So most of the grants we give out are really micro grants, $10,000, really, really small grants. And we've, we speak to creators all the time. And it is for a very emerging creator in Canada, there's a, a, a lot of there's some programs, I mean, including like a film school, right? That's like a program you can get into to kind of further your career. But once you pass that, it's it's really that second, third, fourth step in your career. What we've heard is it can be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to create a space where we can do that. So what we call the hundred thousand dollar edition. So it's a, a, a funding deadline where we just gave out more money per project for those people that have sh they, they have shown there was a requirement to show a track record already. Um, but then we want to enable people to, you know, they don't work with the CBC yet. They don't produce a Netflix show right now, but we want to get them to that space and $10,000 is just not going to do it. So we decided to, um, to do that, that 100K edition. Right. Well, that's great. Well, and, and Tim, it's really interesting because now these, these platforms, these funds are triggering tax credits. And I find even though I've been producing for 20 years, I'm constantly coming back to Bob going like, what? Okay, tell me again what triggers tax credits because it seems to be evolving, which is great and necessary in our community. So can you talk about things like short films, film festivals, and then maybe how you guys are working with some of these, these new funds and, and new platforms, new partners? Sure. Well, it's exciting times in the tax credit department, believe it or not. We're actually having some fun. Um, yeah, we started seeing we started seeing kind of digital distribution content probably two three years ago. Uh, CBC.ca and CTV Extend were licensing dis digital distribution only, and it was the first time we saw that. And it was you know. The, the, the thing, the, the, the issue that we run up against is the legislation itself, because the legislation itself was written in the 80s. And it's got a whole bunch of language in, in the legislation which talks about, uh, you know, s traditional program lengths. Uh, so that kind of counted out short films. Uh, you know, it talks about um, you know, broadcast television. It talks about theatrical releases. And so the legislation, if you look at it, and I brought a copy today that anybody that wants to really geek awesome. out. Awesome. <laughs> we won't read it out to you. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was just going to do it line by line. It's 196 pages, but I figured that's But your accent me. would make it so much better anyway. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, we started to see dig digital distribution um, and short form content coming through to us. And, and then we came to realize that, you know, people are actually... Uh, consuming product differently and you know we're seeing stuff online and we, we had to try and figure out how best to um, how best in the spirit and intent of the legislation that's the that's the buzz phrase that we use in tax credits the spirit and intent of the legislation we can make short form content and digital distribution work for triggering tax credits uh, and I think Telus is, you know, we've seen uh, we've seen quite a lot of um, documentation come through Telus, firstly with Optic, and now with the various other forms of their agreements. And also, I've worked a little bit with Anita and with Canada Screens recently. That we just got to make the agreements work because it's Canadian content that's for Canadians, and that's ultimately what it's about. And so we're just trying to figure out how that works. Um, and so with, sh with, with short form video itself, I mean, we had seen some short form content that, ca that, was, that was allowed to come under the production services. Example is, you know, Disney, Disney shorts, but they've got 10 million to spend on a five minute piece. Right. So now we've got to figure out how to, you know, how in the real world and, you know, uh, real, real people and filmmakers and, and uh, emerging talent, how we can make it work for them. <laughs> So we've been looking and asking, getting inquiries firstly through telephone and email and t speaking with producers directly and, and really trying to work on a case-by-case -case basis on how to make things work. And yeah, we've, we've, we're trying to be a little bit flexible in terms of how we fit these productions with our own legislation. We were the first jurisdiction in Canada to actually try and really make this work. We've had consultations with the Ministry of Finance. 
We've had consultations directly with, uh, with um, CAVCO and OMDC and other, other jurisdictions. And we feel you know, that we can really work with filmmakers through TELUS's arrangements, through organizations like Canada Screens, and, and, um, you know, and really just try and get a bit more tax credit dollars in, into your budgets. Mm -hmm. um, just to, one, the important thing about the legislation that we, we know that we have to work with, we have to work with this language, and there's still certain points within the legislation that we need to adhere to. Mostly that producers are, still need a written agreement with Canadian controlled distribution companies and or CRTC licensed broadcasters. So there is that element to it. Uh, so we're not at the self-publishing stage yet, uh, unfortunately, because our legislation just, just does not fit with that model. Uh, but, you know, over time, who knows? Um, the other thing that I wanted to m mention is, you know, kind of the, the YouTube thing. Now, we're kind of following CAVCO's lead on certain YouTube channels, and there is a list if you go to CAVCO's site and look at the YouTube cha channels. We are trying to work with them on that. Mm. But self-publishing to YouTube doesn't work for us just purely because there is a written agreement with a Canadian-controlled distribution company to release the, pro, uh, the program in Canada within 24 months of completion, that's the first point. But the second point is that a non-Canadian entity can't show or show the production in Canada within 24 months or so. So putting it to YouTube and then try and showing it in Canada just goes against the legislation and right. it creates an offside experience. But can I just ask, I mean, is, is the conundrum not that a lot of these platforms and like, you know, someone like Anita who's launching her platform, she just doesn't have the budget to be putting into productions. So in, in terms of triggering these tax credits, we need a budget to start with. Like with TELUS, of course, it can trigger right. because <clears throat> TELUS is investing in, in your project. So how are you seeing productions come through the door and, and able to actually get some of that tax credit money when maybe their budgets are so small? And, and well, what are you seeing get, in terms Well, of that? they can get tax credit money even if it's a very tiny budget. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still, you know, it's still, what you know, FIBC's 35% year labor expenditure, mm -hmm. Dave tax credits, an additional 16% for Dave and post production items. So you're getting into 40 odd percent of your labor, labor, labor budget right there. Mm -hmm. How you raise the money is a completely different question, right? right? But are you seeing like people are self financing as well? We are seeing self financing yeah. for sure, and there are still, you know, there are still the grant options. There's crowdfunding, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, it's important to note that grants and crowdfunding will grind the uh, the tax credit, uh, what we call the production and the labour cap. So you need to run the numbers a little bit, mm -hmm. but um, but in order to just you know to trigger the tax credit itself, these agreements with Telus mm -hmm. and these agreements with Canada Screens and other entities will trigger yes. that kickback of the tax credit right. you know on your labor on your labor expense right okay well and then I'd love to go right to Lauren who's been you know through this and making content and okay and, and has a really great um, track record of content online obviously with this is that but I know you guys are also really um, it, like I just and big admirers of yours because you really pivot into podcast and and other forms of content so maybe talk about like I, I'm curious to know, is podcasting a way for you to test some content that maybe then you'll bring into the video space and um, something like that? So, anyways, but if you could speak to some of some. Of those yeah, well, I wanted to there. share that about my act our first tax credit experience we're going through right now. Um, I can tell you about podcasts too, although there are no tax credits for podcasts, <laughs> as far as I am aware of. Although I'd love to hear that some are in the works. Um, but I was just going to share that, uh, yeah, we're currently going through our first, or I'm going through my first tax credit application for my for our, my own, or Kelly and Kelly per project. I had worked on bigger Hallmark productions, and like, of course, tax credits were a massive part of those productions. You're in millions of dollars per episode budgets. Um, and then I had also independently produced a ton of documentary films. 
And on those documentary films, it always felt like, well, we're just, we're not doing tax credits. It was like, oh, if we're in that $100,000 budget, it's just not worth it. Because we don't have the trigger yet. We don't have the distribution trigger. Um, maybe it's gonna be Netflix can't, like maybe it's gonna be Netflix and we just don't wanna commit to something that's gonna then limit who we could sell it to. And at that point, we'd probably self-finance the whole amount and then we just go sell it. Or it, it was then like, oh, I talked to a tax accountant and they're like, yeah, and then you gotta do this for a couple years and like all these fees and like at the end, maybe you're gonna get like 15,000 back, like once you've paid all these fees, like done everything. So I felt that for a while in that $100,000 budget range that it wasn't really worth it or it wasn't making sense to us or we kind of just like ignored it. And now this project we're doing with TELUS, um, <laughs> we recently with our tax accountant are going through it and we're like, this is crazy, this is so worth it. Yeah. <laughs> Why were we not doing that on other projects? I mean, clearly we didn't maybe have the triggers for the other projects, but um, it is, yeah, I'm just learning right now how worth it is. I mean, it's huge, like 40% is like a, awesome to be able to get that and to know that our trigger being able to be a streaming platform has been really huge. Um, so yeah, we're really going through that process right now. And I would just say to other independent producers, if you're like, oh, well, it's more for like bigger budget productions, that that feels like it's not the case and and to definitely inquire more. Okay, that's helpful. And then Jeff, I wanted to ask you because you've probably seen a lot of productions come through the door and are there certain pitfalls? Are you, have you seen maybe filmmakers expecting certain things and then maybe falling short of the mark? I think the biggest thing that I've seen over my career is the, uh, it, it's a very common thing, which is simply signed and committed deals um, that are locked before we get a chance to review them. There may be some major problems with these things and there may be some minor problems with these things, but once the deal is signed and committed, it's almost impossible for anything to be changed without some very difficult negotiation. So the first thing that I would just recommend is anybody who, uh, is in the process of either beginning a production or even thinking about it, um, say hi to someone with, uh, on your uh, financial, accounting, and legal teams, whether it's myself or any, anyone else. Have somebody on your side. Often what happens is if we're involved at the beginning of a project, we're able to provide you with some guidance and certainly in some cases before you actually begin production and things like that. Uh, we can provide you with templates or things to get you set up properly. It usually works out much better that way. Mm -hmm. um, and this is maybe a question for all of you. So what I'm hearing too with some of the new platforms and the, the ways in which people are accessing funding, is it that the onus now is on the content creator to almost bring an audience with them where they when they're applying? Or is story still king? If you make a good story, it'll, it'll rise to the top. Um, maybe Catherine, you can speak to that because I know that for a lot of the, for the independent production fund and the Bell Fund, there's um, proof of audience awareness ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Well, also wearing my fan trust hat, I would say always put your audience at the center of everything you do. And um, I think with, with respect to the Bell Fund, um, it's not imperative that you have an audience seated, but it's really important that you know where your audience is going to be and how you're going to reach them and that your distribution arrangement allows you to reach them in that way, in that way and that your plan, this discoverability plan that I referred to earlier, very clearly articulates um, the step-by-step -step that you're going to use to reach the audience in the surrounding platforms as well. So for example, how you're gonna leverage social media, how you're gonna leverage the cast or characters following, um, how you're gonna tap some of the um, uh, very simple tools that exist in platforms like YouTube to boost and drive and encourage repeat viewing. So um, if you can't do that yourselves, and I realize not everyone has that expertise, it's really important that you have someone on your team that's an expert in those very things, in that fan building and in that community building. 
Um, of course, if you have an audience before you apply, well, that's fantastic because there's a true proof of concept there. Um, but you, if you don't, you could always point to similar projects. Like you can't have Pepsi without Coke. You can go out, you can show a model that you like um, and, and how you're going to do something better or differently. And I think that will really speak to our evaluators. The, this, um, Ali, I think you said your audience or our audience. You know, we have to remember that this is a fairly new thing that w we, and actually not me, but you, like the creators have. Oh, as the uh, content ha creators. The content creators have an audience because it used to be always controlled by another, by a third party, like whether you're a musician or whether you're an author or whether you're talking about filmmakers now. Um, you, you were always reliant on. Well, often multiple other parties that sort of part of the ecosystem, the value chain, until it gets to the audience, and they would all, you know, obviously take a cut of any revenues, but they also control the creative, and they'd be sort of in the way. Yes. And and now, I mean, my dear, this has been going on for fifteen years, maybe, right? That we that we have a direct, that we can have a direct connection with the audience, and this is a huge opportunity. So. The, the answer was how important, I think that was the, how important is it to have your own audience? I think it's absolutely critical and it's, it's so amazingly empowering for all creators out there to be able to build the, the, their own audience and, um, and this is, it's, it's so different right now than it was 15 years ago, that's great. Problem is, it's really hard to build an audience because there's everyone can build noise. an audience so therefore yeah. like there's just more competition out there right yeah. so it doesn't actually make it easier but at least it's possible i always like to say when um, um when a, so if a filmmaker has a, an idea a concept anything and they go to a production executive and they can show there's already an existing audience that conversation is going to go very very different than if it's just an idea if someone comes to me oh i've got this great idea for a film if if there's also oh and by the way i already have hundred thousand dollars that follow this person or that is already that's a very very different conversation and it's a completely like it departs a complete power shift right um, i'm not a good example in this because tell us isn't really like we don't we're not a broadcaster but you know if, if i was a broadcaster and you can show like well, there's already a hundred thousand people there like as a broadcaster i want the hundred i don't want the content i want a hundred thousand people right? so you actually the, the creator ha has what the broadcaster wants which is the audience because at the end of the day the broadcaster needs the audience to monetize it Unless you're the CBC, but you know what I mean. It's all about like having that audience already. Um, I lost my train of thought, but well, yes, yeah, really important. But actually, that leads me to a question. So, you guys at Telus, you're not driven by the number of views. Like that, those aren't analytics that you're closely watching, or are you only looking at the number of votes. You know that that's helping to determine how a project is fu is funded. But are you also looking at how audiences are responding to your content? It's a nice story for me to tell my bosses, okay. my boss's boss, if you can show like, hey, and we got a lot of people that watch the content. It's a, it's a, it's a great bonus, yes, absolutely, but it's not the main decision driver for a story I have, no, not at all. It is not the mandate of what we're doing is, um, is to drive audiences. If, if it was, then we probably wouldn't give people people with very little experience, very little money, and very little time to make content. Like right. This is when we're... we're we're not the program is not set up that it creates the most amazing content in the world it, right. it's set up that it creates amazing opportunities for filmmakers to develop their career um so audiences are it's great but it's not the main decision driver that's very refreshing not to hear the word eyeballs constantly thrown at you <laughs> <laughs> um so lauren if you can speak a little to like I'm, I'm a huge fan of your video content from this is that have it have you guys seen that this is that videos that have riffed off the radio show Put up your hands. What? You're not one of the eight million people who've been <laughs> avidly watching this stuff. But maybe then tell us a little bit about that and where it came from and the idea from going from radio to, to video. And I also want to know why you think it was so successful beyond Trump and fake news. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, that's a really big question there, Leah. Um, yeah, so this is that. It's basically fake news. Um, and it's been on the radio, on CBC Radio 1, for the last eight years. We're going into our ninth season in the fall. Um, it's totally just a radio show. And a couple of years ago, we did a video called Artisanal Firewood. My um, favorite one. <laughs> that is just, like, a super serious, like, profile you'd see on Vimeo of... 
an artist, but it, this was someone that made um, artisanal firewood. So like <laughs> all their time went into making um, wood that you're going to light on fire, but cost $1,500. <laughs> and it's just really deadpan, very, very serious. And kind of the, it's, it was kind of our evolution from the radio show. We just did some videos and they've kind of become parodies of internet videos. So we do kind of those like now this, like you'd see on Facebook or yeah, Vimeo shorts or like Netflix shows. And um, and where did you first launch the video? Like had at that point was because what what year did you say you made that one? It was a while ago. Right? Yeah, 2014 or 2015. Okay, so it was more recent than I thought. But yeah. um, so did you launch it on Facebook or how did you? It's how did you changed. Your audience? Yeah, it's funny because. I mean, we clearly have a, a an established audience with this is that from the radio show being in the homes of CBC listeners. But it's funny, our, our like we have maybe thirty five thousand fans on Facebook for this is that. But a video we did called Ball is Soccer has over twenty million views on Facebook. So it's that like, our audience on Facebook isn't what's fueling the the success of the videos. It's definitely the shareability um, that like big other sites. We did one called Water Smuggler, which was like an American coming over to steal Canadian water. <laughs> and yeah, huge other sites picked that up. And um, we never know which ones are going to go really big. We're just in season three right now. Actually, Dale over here is in one of ours called Cross Country Carnage, awesome. um, which exposes the underbelly of the cross country skiing world. A and crazy world of, <laughs> yeah, of <laughs> going on flat ground for hours. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so we really, we don't, yeah, we don't know which ones are going to hit, but pe hmm. things that infuriate people online have been really successful. Um, but it, we're... Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> we have been really fortunate where, um, oddly enough, like CBC, I won't get too much into this, but CBC owns This Is That. Um, so we haven't been able to take the videos and necessarily like make them into a TV show unless CBC wanted to. But... So, like, breakout videos from This Is That have led to other things. Like, we've done a podcast with an American network, and we've had meetings with HBO for other ones. And, like, we just, we never knew what was going to come out of them. They've led to other things that we could never have predicted. Um, and that's what's actually fueled a lot of our work in the last couple of years. And so they are kind of like these statement pieces right. that have, yeah, that we've been able to make into other things. Right. Well, and Jeff, you come from a music background as well, and obviously that's an industry, Anita and I were just talking about this yesterday, that really had to change and has completely pivoted. Some artists would argue maybe not in a good way because they look at their two-cent paychecks from streaming music now, but, they've, but there are new models for how artists are reaching their audiences and maybe monetizing their, their art. Do you, do you see that we need to maybe do more shifting in, in our own industry towards... I think the models. industry is beginning to shift. Um, at one point, I remember saying quite frequently in my office that the recording industry is definitely falling apart, but that the music industry is still very much alive. And I don't see that as being different. Um, but uh, I mean, who's gone to a concert lately? Um, uh, I don't think the ticket prices have gone down at all. and uh, And... Uh, unless you wind up backstage like a little while ago. Um, that was kind of fun. But no, the point is that you're still seeing a lot of revenue generated from music industry. You're just seeing it come from different things. And what we're seeing, for example, with the Netflix model when it comes to exploiting film is that you're seeing a similar type of model where you're paying once for a lot of content. You can't possibly watch all of it all the time. I mean, some people possibly do, but you won't have much of a life. But there's sort of this calculation that somewhere that amount of money divided by that many people will result in a sensible business model for film content. And so I think the shift where you're seeing the aggregators and the flat fee payment system for film is starting to show up now in, in its full glory. And we had seen similar transitions in the music industry about 10 years before that. I usually find that um, having spent most of my at least current career um, of the last 15 years either handling a film deal or a music deal, 
that whatever we see in the music industry seems to show up in the film industry approximately five to seven years later right. as a natural business model transition. Right. Okay, but so then be, if we're behind on that, are there certain things that you see in the music industry that we could learn from and that we could adopt to, in order to, to find success? Um, one of the things is probably to create things that go outside a linear film content. So, for example, in the music world, you see that the music creators that succeed are integrating their music with, you know, uh, uh, connections with, with films, with TV, with live experiences, with interactive experiences, all that other stuff, even packaging and creating an environment that you can't experience unless you do more than just listen to the three and a half minute audio clip you know, um, off your iPad. You're getting more, whatever that is. Um, uh, just as a, as a side example on um, Netflix, I recently saw a live concert um, of Hans Zimmer performing that was done in surround sound that was just absolutely spectacular. It's the kind of music I love. I've always spent a lot of my own time studying other composers and things like that. And it was just an amazing concert. And, and um, you know, I, I was excited because I can actually buy a, a surround sound, um, high definition, audio, visual presentation of that. It was fundamentally music, but I'm getting a Blu-ray and I'm getting it in an environment that actually means something. Mm -hmm. I couldn't just listen to that performance on my um, phone and get the same kind of sonic quality. So it's music plus. Now you're looking at film with the same idea. You're seeing things like uh, interactive. You're, you're looking at things like um, uh, uh, um, experiencing 3D. You're experiencing virtual reality, all of these other things that are add-ons. And so I think film content that gives you something more, audience interaction, voting, those are all things that I think we're moving towards and it's positive. Right. And Jonas, you guys did a VR round at TELUS, right? Can you, can you speak to like, how our audience is going to be experiencing that? What's the, what's the outlet for that? And I know that a lot of content creators are scratching their heads around VR and whether it's AR or VR right now that's going to take over. So can you speak to how that experience was? And then... Catherine, I know you guys have an immersive fund as well. We, um, one of our additions or one of our funding rounds was focused on um, immersive content, so 360 video or VR. And um, you asked the question about where it's going to go afterwards. Well, how, uh, how, how are you guys going to ask um, the content creators for their, like how are their audiences going to be experiencing it? Do we go, go to a TELUS booth? <laughs> no, um, we, so... That, okay, that's a big question you're asking because in the whole, for those of you that are involved in this, in the whole VR or 360 or AR side, everyone's very excited about it, including myself. We have not seen the audience adoption that we thought we were going to have because it, it, it should be so obvious. We all have, there's two in front of me, two VR devices in front of me. You can buy this three, third one over there and in everyone's pocket. The carport is about $20 and you can have a really awesome VR experience. Have you ever seen anyone like on the bus or something doing it? Like I've never seen, never. And we look so but we watched right. we've watched people do Pokemon Go, right? Like or like the sure. Pokemon. Yeah, sure, exactly. So for some reason, there's something missing, and I don't know what it is. So the numbers that I see, people are not using it. People don't do it. So um, um, we we're just lazy. We just want to experience. I guess maybe I don't know. I think it's a. I think VR is. It's a weird experience. It's very insular. It's very alone. You can't. I. I don't like it. Like when. I, when. When you guys. I would not do it in front of you because I get so self-conscious. Because you know. I'm. I'm in this world, but you're still here. Like not. It's just not. I'm actually like not comfortable with it. Um, so yeah, when we, uh, we knew that going into this as well, and we actually like we're going to put the, the films on YouTube afterwards, which is sort of um, uh, VR compatible or whatever. Um, but we don't know exactly how it's going to take off. We actually do not know. For, for us, the focus was really, again, on the, on the filmmakers, allowing creators to, to kind of try it out, the craft of telling a story, and that was important for us. We wanted to see, see stories, not experiences. We've all probably done it before, where you put it on and you're like, oh, I'm in a waterfall. And then like 15 seconds in, great, water. great yeah. waterfall. Yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> Loved it. But we want to 
tell stories but you actually yeah. want to, you want to stay in there right. um yeah we will see where where it's going to take off right and I just want to say oh, yeah, podcasts are cool they complimentary are complimentary <laughs> to i guess the show on netflix nailed it has a complimentary podcast oh really a lot of cool shows. No, like I mean, you Walking know what? Dead, After like serial, shows. people were like, okay, podcast is the new thing. And it's like, who would have thought that? But even you know? as complimentary to your show, like yeah. fan podcasts or like behind the scenes podcasts, like mm -hmm. definitely huge sci-fi show, Game of Thrones podcast, you know, like they're, they're really cool. Like you don't necessarily have to go like to new technologies. Yeah. Well, what I find interesting, because I have kids that are getting to that age where we're letting them play with a with a mobile device once in a while, but I don't want to give them like a, a streaming, you know, but I, I'm happy to, for them to like download a podcast and then I know what they're listening to and they're not, you know, streaming and streaming music that I don't know what the lyrics say, you know what I mean? So it's, it's interesting. I found that I'm seeking out podcasts. You and I had this conversation. I'm like, there's not enough podcasts for kids. So there's an idea right there. You can, you've heard it here first. So, but I wanted to ask, so you guys obviously have an immersive interactive fund, which I unsuccessfully applied for and was told my project wasn't immersive enough, so I still don't get it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but maybe talk to, I don't know if you had a chance to see what some of the projects that came through the door and if you can speak to that. Um, so, so the Bell Fund has been financing VR, AR, mixed reality for, I'm gonna say about four or five years now. As like uh, yes, yeah. exactly. And now we've launched um, an immersive web docs fund, and there's no 10% third-party cash required, so that's a bonus. But we uh, only give 75% of your total budget. So, um, you know, in terms of what these things are going to look like, um, I think I would point to um, things that are in... Uh, the uh, Guardian or the New York Times, these highly uh, immersive, story-driven um, works of deep investigative journalism as models of excellence. I think the NFB has also done some really wonderful things. Um, we're still finding our feet on all of these programs, so there's no right answer as to what truly immersive is, but. I would say that whereas in the past, maybe a flyover VR experience was immersive enough, now we're looking for something that is very gamified, very experiential. Um, and um, we also know that as creators, there's not a huge history of, of producing in 360. And so we're also <laughs> aware that you're learning how to do this on the fly. Um, so it, if you come forward and tell us you, you want to try something and you think it's going to work and you make a great case for it, um, we may not be able to point to a, a model of excellence that's comparable or a reason why you can't do it. So that gives you a strategic advantage. So I would encourage you to look at that, those of you who are um, nonfiction and documentary producers. And I have a question about how, how do tax credits work for that? Because especially if something is linear story driven, mm. but maybe it is told in a VR way, do you have to calculate a percentage that is actually, or is all of it considered digital media? It's, we're falling into a, an amalgamation, I find, that it's hard to def define and separate now. I don't think we've seen one. Oh, interesting. I don't think we've seen an. Uh, oh, I, I've, I've not even taken an inquiry for VR or AR. Wow. I think it's it's still very much early adopter phase. Mm -hmm. I think um, the the legislation. I mean, the legislation is clearly written for linear programming, and so it doesn't even accommodate any of that. And I don't think we've even tried to you know, beat the bushes about this stuff yet, about how we're going to make that work. Hmm. Uh, I suppose if once we start getting those kind of inquiries, then we're going to have to sit down with the ministry and say, you know, how are we going to start making this work? But the tax credit is just purely for linear content right now. Mm -hmm. And um, so, it, I mean, there is, a, there is an interactive digital media tax credit that's administered by the Ministry of Finance themselves, not Creative BC. 
And so, I mean, any inquiries really for that, you, you, you might want to go check out the Ministry of Finance website and their, and their um, interactive tax credit. Uh, I don't know any of the parameters of that. I apologize, but no. uh, yeah, Google. I wasn't it even aware of that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'll, well, I'll just give you another resource. Um, so the group that does the lobbying on those international or the interactive digital media tax credits is our very own DigiBC, um, which is the industry association for video games, visual effects, animation, and digital marketing. And so there are a lot of good resources on that website and a, a community that really understands how to access those credits. Yeah. Um, and a really good group of people for you to collaborate with if you've never experimented in that genre. Um, as you were talking, oh, I, I know your tax credits, but and you can't speak to the development side, but I know um, you know, it was a challenge at Creative BC where the market triggered development fund was undersubscribed to, which made me angry. I was like, wait, we've got provincial money and we can't find the broadcasters to develop our content anymore in order to trigger those tax credits, or uh, sorry, that development oh. fund. Um, I'm just wondering, because I know you guys have really been trying to uh, like make more accommodations, and just this last round of the Bell Fund, um, where it was like the slate funding, um, are you seeing that it's being, do you know if it's if it's now being top, like, is it still undersubscribed, or are you finding are you finding now that there's new ways that people are accessing it? Uh, in terms of the development department and the development funding, I believe there's news to follow. Um, there's uh, there is some new relationships that are being formed. Uh, I think this is this is not yet out in the press, so I can't really talk to it. But I would watch you know watch this space and maybe just uh, subscribe to Creative VC Facebook page. <laughs> And um, yeah, there's, the, the, there's some information coming down the pipe pretty soon. There's been budget meetings only this week. There's, uh, there's, there's some really exciting announcements in terms of development funding. Um, you know, the province is really getting behind a lot of the content creators and emerging talent. And I think there's going to be some new stuff. Um, just in terms of, um, I, just, I did just want to talk about, you know, the tax credit you know, process. Um, one of the things that we find time and time again is that producers, particularly people that are doing this for the first time, think about tax credits as an afterthought. And I think that's a big mistake this day and age. There's, there's, there's tax credits that are available. And I think people really need to bring tax credits up to the front end of develop, development and set up the production Pretty much uh, what my esteemed colleague just talked about. You've got to set up the production correctly. If you set up your production correctly from the outset, you'll, you'll hit the marks of the legislation. If you think of it afterwards and then think, oops, I didn't set the production up correctly, you're not going to make it. It's going to be offside. So I would just encourage people to really contact us. The thing about Creative BC is that you'll always get a human to talk to. Mm. And so call us, you know, call our department and talk to us about your production and we can advise you on the best way to set up your production from the outset and so you know that you're going to be able to, to apply for tax credits, for FIBC tax credits for the most part, and, you know, be successful in your application. So give us a call and talk to us. And just to follow up on that, I think um, what, you know, uh, you know, a panel like this and the topic of the day is that we're talking about financing and funding. One of the things you have to keep in mind also is that as much as there's all sorts of different sources of funding that we're talking about, which also includes private funding, whether that's from an individual source or crowdsourcing or that type of thing, you do have a lot of steps to think about. For example, if you decide that you're going to get, I'll just say, uh, funding from multiple private sources, because crowdfunding has its own connotations. You've got to watch out the way you raise that money. Just as an example, if you decide you're going to just randomly incorporate a company and sell shares, you're going to be hearing from the Securities Commission pretty quickly because that's illegal. Uh, unless, of course, you want to spend the uh, $400,000 to become a publicly traded company. So you have to be careful that you don't cause yourself a problem by raising money in a way that doesn't comply. 
Once you do, let's say, comply with crowdsourcing or you have one individual that's willing to fund you, that person's probably going to want some security for their money. Then you run into the problem that these other wonderful funding sources also want security for their money and they're going to want a certain um, corporate position or some kind of security position for their money. And you have to juggle all of these different sources and figure out, yes, getting the money in is a really good thing, but then how does the money come back to your sources? How is that being dealt with? A lot of independent filmmakers and creators love to say, I want to raise investment and I'll be very generous back to my investors. And I say investors generally, not just the, the formal funders, but also people who are private but they don't really know what they mean and they come up with concepts that don't quite work um, the way that it ought to. One thing that I would add on to that is that um, shows like Dragon's Den have completely ruined people's ideas what good and bad <laughs> investments are because right. if I had an idea I would never go and say I think it's worth this I'm going right. to give you this percentage of my idea. Yeah, right. um, one of the things a lot of people don't know is you can completely separate the profit sharing part of whatever you're doing with the control part of whatever you're doing. So I could, for example, say, I would like to offer 50% of my future profits from the movie that I make, but I'm keeping 100% control of the movie. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people want that, but they don't quite know how to structure that. Becomes a very important thing though, between the idea that you want to keep creative control and have your funders respect that because otherwise why are they investing the investor you really want to be careful to run away from from many years of law practice that i've seen is the person who has no interest or sorry i would say no talent or ability in creative field but they want to buy their wind into a creative project with their money all you're going to wind up is with lawsuits out the other end <laughs> where the money person now disagrees creatively with the people yeah. who came up with the idea. And I can assure you that that um, uh, dispute resolution part of my practice was very well exercised over right. the last decade. I will Hold say on. that I have not yet, and I hope never to, have a deal where I originally structured end up in litigation. I haven't had that yet. Right. But I can tell you that there's been many deals structured mostly by people on their own where we've had to do dispute resolution and that costs roughly five to 10 times what it would have cost to structure it properly. So I think the lesson here is talk, talk to your lawyer first before anything and talk to your tax credit specialist. And I do, I do wanna open it up for questions, but I do hope, if anything, what I'm hearing here and, it, it, and I hope that it's being um, communicated to you is that I know that a lot of people think our tax credits are onerous trying to get some of these funds are onerous. It, you have to be inside of some system in order to access it. And what I'm hearing from every single person here is that there's such great opportunity and very uniquely to BC and Alberta, there's opportunity here. So I hope that, um, that that's coming across. So I, at this point, I'd love to um, open it up to questions and see if anybody and has questions. The mic yeah, for Anita will yes. a question. Okay, we got a question right here. Hi, I have two actually. The first one's for Story Hive. So I've pitched two projects unsuccessfully. <laughs> and one thing that I found really interesting is there's no analytics. So I found the whole process a little not very transparent. So I was wondering why I can't see how many votes I've gotten, how many people have seen it, and that would be really helpful if I'm going to pitch again, right? Yeah, the number of votes, yeah. That's something we discussed a number of times. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on with the votes uh, um, during and after the fact. So um, I guess I can talk about this here. I think. Um, it's only being recorded. Exactly. Uh, let's just say some people feel they have ways to increase the number of votes that they had received. And um, that is clearly not allowed. It just makes sense what I'm trying to say. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff happening after the fact where we have to go through and it's actually really labor intensive and there's like a bunch of stuff that, that we do. Um, we have a whole external company that does that for us. They do this for a living, the Cineco people. They run that whole website for us. Um, so we have to be a little careful kind of what we, what information we give out because 
you know, if we tell you we had a million votes, I'm sure you didn't do that, but it might turn out after the fact mm, you didn't. So uh, we have to be just a little, little careful with that. Um, I think the analytics that that one could focus on is certainly the number of views of your pitch videos, the number of follows, the number of retweets. So there's a bunch of stuff that's out there, um, but with the votes, it's just it's going to be a can of worm that we're going to open, and it'll for everyone involved is going to cause us sort of it's going to cause more problems than it solves. That's our belief. Yeah. You, you didn't like the answer. So I, <laughs> so I, give you uh, the answer. Yeah. I don't, well, I mean, even if it was a month later, right, where I know that you can pay to automate votes, right? I didn't do that, but you would discover that, and then even like a month after the results came out, it would still be beneficial to see, hey, I got 500 votes. Like, otherwise, you have no idea, right? Yeah. Tons of people come up at events, I voted, I voted, I voted, like, wow, I did better than last time, but I still have no clue how I did. Yeah. So I think... That I, and I've heard from other people too that it becomes discouraging at one point where you've put all this effort into these projects and then you don't really know why. Because there is another component, right? There's the jury. So Absolutely. what's the percentage? How much does my vote count versus the jury? And it just feels like you put a lot of effort in and then there's not the transparency back. Yeah, I mean, the, I know you're not asking that question, but we also have people asking for feedback from the jury. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing that... We get a few, last time we had 300 applications, I think. Mm -hmm. 300 applications. So by the way, that's actually the percentage to get. The money's actually not that bad. Three, we awarded, how many did we do last time? We, we are about to do, well, I'm trying to think right now, I'm really getting mixed up. No, in, in two weeks, we're gonna do 40. So 340, so the numbers are kind of good. It, giving feedback to everyone individually is just not, um, this is not feasible for us, unfortunately. I know you didn't ask this question, but I'm sort of adding to my point where it's, we have to we have to sort of manage the process also for the team. It's a small team, and you know, yeah, that's like, any of these steps that you suggest. And of course, we hear the feedback all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what? Yes, it would be an awesome idea, but it it opens like a whole new thing where we don't have to think about like a number of weeks of like talking about it and you know, if you give feedback. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, that's a whole whole other thing. But thank you for the for the yeah. comments. Yeah. Oh, and I did have one more question. This one is for Bell and you. When you're looking at an audience. What do you look at? Is that the number of followers on Facebook, the number of views on YouTube? Like, how do you, is it just, oh, I've determined that these types of people who are here online will watch it, which is kind of iffy. Like, that's, that's a prediction versus. I, I, so from the Bell Fund's perspective, we're looking at, as I mentioned, a very customed and custom and highly detailed discoverability pitch, really. So you are building a case. If you think views are more important than subs, or if you think time on video is more important than responses or retweets, you're telling us you're making the case and you're saying why for that audience, that's the valuable metric. So we look at everything dispassionately. We look at the integrity of the case that you're making, but then we also have some savvy within our evaluators, so you know they'll they'll fact check that against um, what they know to be true from their own experience or previous proposals. So I would just encourage you to be really really thorough about the case that you're making and make it a fifty thousand dollar case. I just wanted to share from, I mean, I'm obviously not a funding body, but um, as a creator, I think, and I don't want to like make you guys never fund me again, but as a creator, it can get super discouraging to always have to make a trailer or some, like, something and to then ask all your friends to vote or to be pumping it around. And I, I've done two story hives and, um, and Annabelle Fund actually um, many years ago. And uh, I just, yeah, like I was very much on the side of like, why do I have to do this stuff? Like in so many friends that just did the IPF and it's like they all frantically got their teaser done, shot in my house, like all this stuff. And now they're like pumping it, they pumped it. And um, I just want to, you know, say like I'm very much on the side of the creators where I understand the exhaustion in that and how frustrating it can be. Um, but I very much have, and I'm, this is not an advertisement for Telus or, Bund come, or Bell coming from me, but I 
I definitely do see um, the benefit of building an audience. I think it is really, really super valuable. We've seen it in our work. I've seen it in my work personally as a director, how valuable it is, and I appreciate it. And even though I hated asking people for votes, I now am very appreciative of it. Um, and, and also I think that I have come to um, appreciate also that what, if you do receive the funding, you don't answer to anybody. And that has been such a gift. And I feel very proud as a Canadian that, I, that, that we even have the chance to apply for these funds because I have worked with many broadcasters that you do something and then you get a million rounds of notes and suddenly the thing that you were making no longer really is that thing that you set out to make. And um, so yeah, I think I just see it as like, it's, it's such a privilege to get to make what I want, truly what I want to make. And, um, and that is part of like doing a teaser or some kind of short and asking and like building some kind of audience is the thing that I need to do in order to get to make this like awesome thing that I want to make and that I don't have to answer to anybody else. I would, I would love to be in a position or I think we, we all would love to be in a position that anyone who wants to make a thing is going to get the money to make a thing, right? It's that, of course, that's, that, that would be wicked, like amazing. But there's only like sort of there's some limitations uh, on our side, largely budget. And hopefully, I'm not saying it's perfect, but hopefully we came up with a way to make the decision process in a way that is helpful for the creator, helpful for us as well. So a process that allows us to sort of make, make good decisions, make the right decisions. And um, is it perfect? No. And we make changes all the time. Like, I think we all make them. You, Catherine, you mentioned like a bunch of changes. You guys just went through. You know, we're not making the changes because we l want to make a changes. We we try and really figure out like how can we make this process the best process possible, which is inherently not a good process. Three hundred applications, forty going to get funded, and then you know, of course, not. It's just that's just what's going to happen. I, I I don't know what to do about that. I, I would love to change it, but that's the one limitation that we have. We got a question here. Hi, my name is Jolie, I'm a content creator. And actually this question is for Catherine because um, just when I, I went to the Bell site and just to see what the requirements are to apply for the funds, but you almost need a fund, a development fund to meet all the requirements to apply for the fund because it costs money to put a discoverability plan together and to shoot a trailer and to do research and find writers and people to edit and post. I mean, this stuff costs money, and I think this is one of the places that content creators also get stuck, because they actually can't afford to put together the materials to get the money to make the stuff they okay. want to make. I Totally fair point. And we do have a slate development fund. So if you come to us with a number of ideas in a bundle, that allows you to put together the kind of material that you might want to use for production financing. So for example, it would allow you to um, create Bibles, pivot your business from a more traditional to a more digital model, to go out and source great team members. Um, and. Uh, we really understand we're very much a blend of development funding and production funding. Um, and and uh, if, if you work with us in the next year and communicate with us, uh, and that's the feedback you're giving us, that um, you know, we, we are going to listen and respond. This is still a pilot year for us. Uh, and, and we'd be really curious of, of the ones that go through development, how many then go on to get fully produced. Um, with that slate fund, it's a recoupable advance, so it's not a grant. So if in fact you do go, in, go ahead and get production financing, you would end up paying that back. Got a question at the back of the house. Leah, are you wanting to say something? Oh, I was I went through the Slate Development Fund application process, and it was a big application. And I misread the guidelines, um, because what you do require is 10%. So I applied with three projects, and you had to have 10%. What I read was 10% of your, your entire fund had to be a third-party funder. And I had CMF on one of my projects, but it was enough to 
create a 10%, you know, uh, threshold for, for my entire slate fund. But then I was told, no, you have to have 10% of each fund. And what was unfortunate is I said, well, the market trigger from, from Creative BC has been undersubscribed, so that money is basically guaranteed. But the Bell Funds, were, they were in a position where they were like, you know, unless you can actually guarantee that money now. And I was even at a market with Bob from <laughs> Creative BC. I was like, Bob, write a letter right now. He's like, I can't do that. So anyways, but he got that feedback and, the, and Bell got that feedback. So hopefully things will change so that we can, because just getting that 10% on development to apply for a development fund was like impossible. So, so there are things that, but, but I do appreciate that all these things are changing and trying to meet our needs as, as filmmakers. So. Okay, the question at the back of the house. Hello, thank you for all your insights, really great. Um, just wondering where are we at now with branded content uh, qualifying for these things? Um, there's actually nothing stopping you uh, from having branded content. Uh, so we don't encourage um, uh, sort of advertising, but um, to have brands involved um, right from the get go is the, the spirit of that. When I, when I talk about creating filmmakers, we absolutely support it. Um, that's amazing. You know, that's that's put a a way to tell to tell stories, um, and and we we want to support that. There's a few things that we can't allow based on CRTC restrictions that we're working under. Um, but generally, we're, we're open to consider that. In, insofar as tax credits is concerned, um, advertising is an ineligible genre. Uh, however, we do see uh, a fair few um, programs that have sponsorships. And the, 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 uh, um, yeah, the financing is purely sponsorship money. Um, there seems to be, um, particularly on Vancouver Island, there's a lot of fishing shows. <laughs> I don't know why they like fishing over there. And this, we do at least a dozen of these, and um, they're, all they're all sponsorships, you know, so there's logos flashed at the front and at the end, and so that's its form of branding advertising, surely. And so that kind of advertising uh, we will take. You probably need to speak to Cavco about your federal tax credit, uh, but we, we've definitely certified those kind of you know, ways of financing. There was one other thing, just not answering your question, but I'd be, if I don't get the chance, I wanted to mention that um, it's a little known fact that these triggers in tax credits, um, festivals, film festivals, yeah. also tri trigger your tax credits. Mm -hmm. And only in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a number of applications for Webfest. And that's kind of in your area, right? And so Webfest itself, we've 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 enabled um, we've enabled the screenings of shorts at Webfest to trigger the tax credit. So that that may be relevant here. I felt like there was a couple hands that went up. We only have a few more minutes. Okay, the name. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I want this recorded. Yes, thank you. Um, Tim, you kind of alluded to this already, but um, do you have you found scenarios or circumstances where um, uh, an applicant has met the criteria for Creative BC for FIBC or for, um, but then has run into problems with CAVCO? Um, I mean, not everybody that applies for FIBC applies for federal as well. Sometimes there are slight differences on the way CAVCO view a file than we view a file for sure. Uh, so I, I don't, I can't speak to individual cases. Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, certainly before Cavco announced that online platforms were eligible to claim f for their tax credit, there were files that they were denying, and we were saying, well, it meets with our spirit and intent. Remember that phrase? It meets with the spirit and intent of our legislation, so we're going to go for it. So there's maybe that example. We got one more question here. Okay. Hi. Um, are there certain genres that you find get more tax credits or are more successful? Mm. Fishing shows. Yeah, we like <laughs> we like fishing shows. Um, I don't think so. No, I can't. I, I, you know what? We don't have the data to say there's, uh, what the genre splits are. Not yet. We've got a new process. We've got a new FIBC pro, um, application coming out within the next eight weeks. 
And that way, we'll be able to answer that question this time. We don't have year. to download the doc fund anymore, where your name is like up in a corner when you're trying. To yeah, it's it's. <laughs> it's all going to be online. It's, it's going to be great. FIBC, <laughs> like you know, it's going to be a breeze. Uh, so I don't know the answer to the question. I don't think we, we track it. I mean, clearly, I mean, just in terms of um, how we've seen the business here in Vancouver, it's, you know, in the 15 years I've been in this business. You know, from lots of kind of drama to then, you know, lifestyle shows heavy like it is now. So we see a lot of lifestyle shows, but of course we do see a lot of drama. You know, we see immeasurable numbers of Hallmark shows here and mm -hmm. uh, that are all shot in the same postcode of Langley. Mm -hmm. um, On the same street. Yeah, so the same no, I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I mean, there's a good mix. We see a lot of docs, a lot of lifestyle shows, a lot of drama. Um, yeah, it's a good mix. Um, and before we end, I just wanted to ask, Lauren, what is the TELUS project that you're doing right now? You guys can get early advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are making a show currently called Human People, and it's uh, fake documentaries <laughs> of human people and human stories. And the whole goal, was I allowed to say that? You did. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, recorded now. The whole goal is to make... Um, a pilot to then go shop around and really turn into a TV show. Right. I think what I am. Um, I never told you this. this took so oh long. God. <laughs> I never told you this, but um, this is so it's a f fake documentary. We fund a lot of documentaries, like you know, as part of Story I Have and other tell us stuff. There's a lot of documentaries. Are you making a parody of our other shows? Yes. You, you, we, you're making fun of us. Yeah. 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 We're celebrating. So we're celebrating. celebrating. By making there fun you of go. Us. So, yes. Well, uh, a huge thank you to all of you that participated. This has been a lot of information, and I really appreciate everyone's time. And I've learned a lot, and it's been nice to see you all. Um, so thank you, Anita, for putting this on. I think yeah. we're having some drinks in the lobby, if you want to stick around and corner all of these people with all your questions, or maybe just say hello. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you so much, you guys. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. And please do stick around. We're just going to hang out in the um, reception area for a while, and the bar is open. You can grab some nibblies and a glass of wine or beer or something. All right, we'll see you up there. <laughs>